So, moving from the, uh, the dark imaginings of a depressed and unhappy family, we'll go on to a lighter note. The famous murderer... <clears throat> Carlo Gisvaldo, <clears throat> spoken, spoken about to us by our own Rebecca Power. Composed by Carlo Gesualdo and first published in 1611 as part of his sixth and final book of madrigals. Secular pieces written for several voices, usually without instrumental accompaniment. Now, along with his madrigals, Gesualdo published three books of holy music and many more of his songs never made it into print which is a shame, because in the annals of music history, Carlo Gesualdo is remembered as an unparalleled genius. His compositions explored forms that had never been heard before and would be not be explored again for over 200 years. At the time, his music was a bizarre anomaly, and these days he more often co is compared to the expressionists of the early 20th century than to his contemporaries. Today, he is revered as a dominant influence of Igor Stravinsky and the prefigure to Richard Wagner. And Moro Lasso is his masterpiece. It heavily employs the chromatic third relations he's famous for, includes all 12 notes in a scale within a single phrase across multiple voices, is replete with polyphonic cross relations, features contrapuntal rhythms, and is sharply dissonant in its harmony. <laughs> And for those of us who do not have a degree in music theory and do not understand what I just said, do not worry, neither do I. <laughs> Let's just say that Gesualdo is famous for writing music that you wouldn't think sounded good. Especially when judged by the standards of the time. In the late Renaissance, the artistic ideology was ars perfecta. Essentially, every medium had an ideal form and an artist who had mastered it, and the further you deviated from that form, the crappier your art was. Painting was just Raphael by numbers. And the standard for musical composition was Joachim de Pre, who may as well have been the saint of regularized musical language and form. And so Maro Lasso, which is irregular at every angle, was not good music. And Carlo Gesualdo was not a good composer. He was an amateur, an eccentric, and a dilettante. And his station in life would never have permitted him to become a professional musician welcomed in noble courts. It would have been beneath him. Carlo Gesualdo, you see, was a prince. So how does an Italian prince who nobody thought was any good go on to become one of the most influential and legendary figures in modern music? Why not both? To help contextualize the circumstances of Gesualdo's rediscovery and rise to musical prominence, I will invoke one of his contemporaries. William Shakespeare's own life encompassed Gesualdo's entirely, and the events of Gesualdo's life encompassed every aspect of a true Shakespearean drama. And I do mean all of them. And it is through the lens of a tragedy that we may best understand how Gesualdo came to write his music and how he is remembered today as the Prince of Darkness. This talk, by the way, is going to be goth as fuck. Don Carlo, third prince of Venosa, eighth count of Conza, 15th lord of Gesualdo, uh, was born in 1566. For over 500 years, the house of Gesualdo had been known for its talented fighters, writers, and musicians. Even as a child, a child Carlo was exceptionally bright, unnervingly intelligent. Genius Einstein brain, and Brainiac are the contemporary nomenclature for people who are a bit quicker than the rest of us. When Don Carlo was alive, they called the smart ones demons. 
As the second son, he was free to pursue his early passion for music to his heart's content, but in 1584, Carlo's older brother, Luigi, died, leaving Carlo the heir apparent. He rose to the occasion with wedding bells and flying colors. In 1586, he married his first cousin, Doña Maria de Avalos. House de Avalos was, of equal, was equal to Gesualdo, and Maria had already been married twice and proven herself, and proven herself by bearing two children. She was also rumored to be the most beautiful woman in all of the kingdom of two Sicilies. Rumors which were aided by the circumstances of her first husband's death, a massive coronary attributed to an excess of connubial bliss. In the first blissful years of their marriage, Maria and Carlo had two sons. And they may have continued blissfully for far longer had it not been for another man, Don Fabrizio Carafa, Duke of Andrea, known for his beauty as the Angel of Naples. But don't feel too bad for Carlo, at least not just yet. Just remember that to be beautiful, you have to suffer. The affair started as expected. An exchange of glances, dances, words. Notes passed between servants, secret meetings made and kept. Carlo's uncle, Giulio, who had also been pursuing Maria and was rebuffed several times and finally threatened by Maria to reveal his antics to her husband, was the first to break the news. When Giulio discovered that Maria wasn't a pious lady but merely screwing someone else, the spurned man went straight to Carlo. Now, Carlo probably could have killed her then, but Carlo wanted proof. And, but someone or something tipped off the two lovers that Carlo had gotten wise, and briefly the affair ended. Oop, I went back. That's fine. And so, just like Shakespeare, uh, Maria first pursued uh, Maria first pursued Fabrizio, who declined out of the obvious threat to their honor and also lives. And Maria told him that God had made an error in making her a woman with the spirit of a knight and making him a knight with the spirit of a woman. Because of what happened next, their letters were preserved and their excerpts in translation give you an idea of how this went down. Fabrizio said, literally, this is what he said. Fair lady, if you would that I should die for the love of you, I shall be greatly honored in being the victim of your beauty. I have the courage to meet my death, but not the constancy to endure yours. For if I die, assuredly, you will not live. This is my fear, which makes me a coward. I have no strength to endure this blow. My Lord Duke, one moment of your absence is more death-dealing to me than a thousand deaths, which might come to me through my delights. If I die with you, I shall never more be separated from you. But if you would go away from me, I shall die, far apart from all that my heart holds dear, which is yourself. Since you wish to die, I shall die with you. Such is your wish, so be it. This was real. This isn't even a play. <laughs> For whatever reason, Carlo wanted proof. And so on October 16th, 1590, he carried out a plan that would haunt him for the rest of his life. He told Maria he was going hunting and would not return that night. Instead, and instead of departing for the forest, he went to the house of a relative and waited. Maria sent word for Fabrizio, who whistled below her balcony at 9.30. At midnight, the prince returned, accompanied by three armed men. It was easy for them to enter the palace undetected. In the preceding days, Don Carlo had changed or broken all the locks on the doors that led to his and Maria's bedchamber. I will forego a full rundown of the injuries sustained by the victims in the official report. Even if you did have the stomach for it, I do not have the time. A strange detail included in the report was that Fabrizio had been discovered wearing one of Maria's lace nightgowns. And it and appeared to have been wearing it when he was murdered. Witnesses also reported that after exiting the room, Don Carlo had stopped short and said, I can't believe she's dead, before rushing back in to continue the violence. <laughs> Dark talk. He left the castle on horseback shortly afterwards, and no one knew where he had gone. To say these murders were a scandal would be an understatement. Carlo, Maria, and Fabrizio were prominent figures in Neapolitan society, and being of noble blood, they were also related to everyone. 
Don Carlo presented himself to the viceroy who deemed the murders just and put an end to the official inquiry. From there, he fled to his castle on the hill in Gisualdo. The law was on his side, but no one else was. To protect himself from vengeful relatives, Carlo ordered all the forests in the castle surrounding valley to be cleared so that he could not be taken by surprise. A witness had also reported that Don Carlo had run into the room of Maria's infant son, whom he no longer believed to be his own. Why he didn't murder the child on that night is unclear, but instead he had the baby brought to Gesualdo. Some say that the infant was placed in a crib hung from the rafters of the Great Hall and shaken so violently that the infant asphyxiated. Another version reports that the cradle was hung from the balcony above the courtyard and for three days and nights a choir sang below it until the baby had expired. Shortly afterwards, in, 1950, or in 1591, Carlo's father died and Carlo became Prince of Venosa. Now, re-entering polite society after brutally murdering your famous wife and cousin, same person, and infant son can be a bit tricky. Among Carlo's many acts of expiation is the monastery he had built at Gesualdo, which still houses a painting that testifies to the tragedy. Now, Carlo is seen prostrated below the Redeemer, who sits at the top in judgment while several other saints petition for contrition on his behalf. The center features a bambino that represents the murdered child. At the very bottom, to the forefront, two souls arrive in, arrive in agony from their place in hell. Time heals all wounds. <laughs> Time heals all wounds, am I right? Because by 1594, Carlo was living at the Duke court of the Duke Alfonso II uh, de Este in Ferrara, the center of art and culture in Italy at the time. Carlo published his first four books of magicals there. And somehow, he was even able to take a new wife, Doña Eleonora de Este in, 19, in 1595, who bore him a son. One historian in particular notes that Eleonora may well have been a very pious wo wo woman, seen as Carlo never murdered her. <laughs> he did beat her, however. Dark talk. <laughs> Undone by latent grief and rage, Carlo had all of the makings of an abusive husband, and then some. He was controlling and unstable, and suffered from fits of rage, despair, and hysteria that could only be quelled by being beaten several times a day by as many as 20 young men retained exclusively for the purpose. But the music was so good. <laughs> Carlo might have been somewhat redeemed in the eyes of society, but it seems that the prince was, had not found peace within himself. If we want evidence of what was going on in Carlo's mind, we need look no further than the titles in his first four books of music. Goth talk. For those of you who studied English, I know what you're thinking. If this were really Shakespeare, there would be witches by now. <laughs> Ye of little faith. The situation somehow managed to deteriorate further from there. In 1597, once the couple had returned to live at Gesualdo, under her husband's thumb, Eleonora became depressed and frequently ill, which worsened in 1600 when the couple's only child, Alfonsino, died, which left Carlo with only one remaining heir, his and Maria's first child, Emmanuel, who was estranged from his father, in part because of the murders, and in part because he was serving under Car Cardinal Alessandro. Alessandro. Alessandro happened to be Eleonora's half-brother, protector, and also possibly her lover. In the next decade, Alessandro offered to petition the Pope to secure a divorce for Eleonora several times, but the princess always refused in the end. If she had not refused, she likely would have gotten it. If not for Carlo's violence, then at least for his infidelity. In 1603, his affairs with two women in his house came to a head. When Eleonora discovered the affair, she had the women both tried for witchcraft. Under torture, they confessed and included lurid descriptions of sexual acts with Carlo that involved feeding him their menstrual blood. They were found guilty, and through his influence, Carlo was able to negotiate that the woman should not be killed, but in instead spend the rest of their lives in a prison, which happened to be located inside his castle. 24-7. <laughs> <24 -7. laughs> 
Carlo spent the rest of his life living in depression and isolation. His severe asthma, difficulty sleeping, intestinal problems, and mental health prevented him from traveling, and rumors about his treatment of his wives, wives uh, made his castle an undesirable destination for polite company. Eleonora fled Gesualdo several times, but she always came back, and in the end, she never divorced him. In 1613, Carlo's only remaining son, Emmanuel, died, leaving the house of Gesualdo with no heir. Carlo himself died three weeks later. His lands and titles were divided and distributed to his relatives, and the house of Gesualdo disappeared. There remains some speculation about the cause of Gesualdo's death. Some historians have postulated that Eleonora murdered him, but that seems like wishful thinking on their part. He had suffered severe asthma for most of his adult life, and it may have been due to trouble breathing, but most of the evidence indicates that he died due to infection brought on by excessive flagellation. 20 guys. That's a lot. Moro Lasso is remembered not just for its musical composition, but also for its lyrics. Carlo Gesualdo is remembered not just for his contributions to expressionism, but for what he was trying to express. And it is because of the circumstances that inspired his work that we still have his work at all today. The details of his life were not preserved as the artifacts of an, artif uh, artif as an, of an artist, but as evidence. His palace in Naples and his castle have been preserved because no one wanted to live in a house that was cursed. And the local legends of Gesualdo el Diablo persisted for almost two centuries before anyone of any influence bothered with his work because they wanted to hear what type of music a demon makes. And when they did unearth him in the early 1900s, the fever that inspired Gesualdo inspired a fever again in the bizarre corners of the art world. Igor Stravinsky wrote the foreword to a seminal study of Gesualdo's life and works and took a pilgrimage to Gesualdo's castle twice. Anatole France wrote a short story about the murders. Philip Heseltine, the preeminent music critic, better known as Peter Warlock, became so obsessed with Gesualdo that he came to believe he was Don Carlo and committed suicide. Aldous Huxley wrote liner notes for a 1956 LP of Gesualdo and once performed an experiment listening to his magicals while high on LSD. <laughs> to date, there are at least 11 operatic works devoted to Gesualdo's life, and he is the subject of a 1995 documentary by Werner Herzog, obviously. And I, personally, while this has not been officially proven, believe that Don Carlo is the reason why all vampires play piano. <laughs> <laughs> now, in our modern era, I personally find it difficult to celebrate someone in spite of what they inflict on others, much less because of it. But even if you don't believe that time heals all wounds, you may find a saving grace in Don Carlo, which is that he was not without remorse. Shakespeare famously said, all the world's a stage and all its people's players. Tonight, I raise my glass to the rare exceptions, to the musicians and demons among us who can evoke heaven on earth from where they dwell in the pit. Cheers. Yeah.